Um, I've got some questions and can start to ask them, but is anybody ready to ask a question already? Uh, yes, we've got one down here. And while we're getting the microphone, just um, hold those thoughts. So, Angeline, perhaps first, how can agribusinesses learn from fast-moving consumer good businesses to value add? Yeah, great question. So um, I think one, some of the things that, you know, I think all of us actually touched on rather than just the, the processes that I had before was um, absolutely that market-driven approach and that consumer-led, I think, starting from the demand, but also making sure that along that journey of your whole value chain, you can start to use that model that I showed up, which was the Dublin one, in terms of where value is, because it may be that it's not always about creating a product, and maybe initially it's about creating a product, but maybe you've created a process that you want to leverage and that you want to then take on and actually start to um, create profit and different business models as well. So I think that's one. I think the other bit is, is around trying to make sure that we can learn as much as from FMCG because you know they are pretty good at what they do and I guess you know for my 20 years I've learned from that and seeing how you can apply a lot of that thinking but also bring the nimbleness that is in the agribusiness uh, which is all about also doing it different and I think that's where there's magic to happen. Uh, Christy, just before we get to that question, you feel like you've developed the whole thing yourselves but you know have you have you borrowed ideas and those sorts of things in your development? It's a great question. We have developed the whole thing ourselves. I suppose when it came to releasing our premixes and things like that, certainly looked at, you know, definitely borrowed some ideas there about what would make it easier for our customer to, to have our products in their life. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's a question. Yeah, that's on. It's on, okay. Um, firstly, thank you to the, the all of you. Very good um, presentations all around. My question's to Krista. Um, you know, we, we all, well, I'm from the horticultural industry. Um, we see it time and time again, the oversupply of all of our products, um, limited market oversupply of products and stuff like that, and then we have market failure. Now, I'm all for free markets and open markets and stuff, but with the big problem we have with waste, do we need to go back to a quota system with growing products? Um, quota systems are very, very archaic, but it limits because farmers, we tend to overproduce. It's when we, the prices are good, we plant more and we create a bigger problem. So my question, it can be to anybody, but quotas. Are you all happy for me to take yeah, this one? <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I missed your name. Nikki. Nikki, Nikki nice to meet you. Look, I think that's a great question. I have always had this belief that X population equals X amount of growing, but it's just not going to happen. And in fact, I had this conversation over lunch today that our neighbours um, will say, oh, they just got $80 a tray for avocados. That's it. I'm going to pull out my macadamia trees, my banana trees. I'm going to plough it all in and I'm going to plant avocados. There are millions of avocados that have gone into Australia in the last you know, two, three years. In five years' time, I'm actually quite frightened. I don't know what's going to happen. There is going to be that many avocados on the market. We are all going to have to start eating smashed av for breakfast, lunch and dinner, or we're going to have to come up with something very creative because, yes, we can say we're going to export all of this stuff, but in the reality, is it going to happen? We have to still be price competitive. You know, Mexico's there, it's clean, green, and they are on on price. So we have to take into consideration alternative industries. And the industry that I work in now, we actually go around and we buy bananas or sweet potatoes or broccoli or pumpkins or beetroot, whatever it is that we are processing, we go and buy that produce from those farmers. That produce would have ordinarily been thrown away and we actually buy it as a second grade produce to turn it into the products that we're making. And I think that without saying, oh, you know, let's have this legislation and more red tape about X amount of growing X population, if we have some more sustainable ideas, such as the one that we've managed to come up with, I think that's the true solution to the problem. And, and I also think it's drastically unfair that farmers are often expected to give away their excess produce for free. 
You know, it's a lovely fanciful idea, but it, it's just not going to work well in the long run. Has that answered your question? Yeah. Have we got another question? Um, I was thinking that um, you've just raised the avocado, smashed avocado issue, and uh, Angeline, what about the um, millennials and the Z generation who love these smashed avocados, uh, reportedly more than houses? Um, <laughs> what impact are they going to have on the way that products are, are shopped and consumed? Yeah, I, th I think, look, lovely that they're eating smashed avocados, right, in terms of how much they pay. Fantastic for the economy at the end of the day. I don't know how much the farmer gets it, so I think that's a, a question mark. But really what we're seeing globally now is this move to what is now the millennial generation, right? So millennials hot on their tails, with, which is the Zs, which are between 12 and 22, 23 now. So these guys are more conscious. They are going to probably want to be more consumer focus and consumerism and spending power than any other generations before them. So I think they will actually shift. But the other thing is, as I said up there also is, is they are very, very conscious. It's what I call the conscious consumer. So they're interested in a story like Krista's and they will actually go and find your banana flower and buy it and talk about it and share it. Uh, more so than maybe I will, sorry, Krista, because I'm not just that, just, just that generation as, as much as I want to be Y again. Uh, but part, part of it is, is, is making sure that as these consumers, and they're actually we're seeing that the same type of behaviour in Singapore, in China, in the US, in Australia. So the millennials, I don't want you to tar them with just a, a generic view, but really what we're seeing is that conscious thinking that they're bringing in, and they're going to make the biggest impact that we will see to brands and consumerism, I think, um, anywhere globally. So um, that's actually my tipping point. So I can ask Andre that in a minute, the same question about, you know, what, what drives, you know, organic, whether Paddy's is meeting that market. But um, you could talk a bit about uh, milk and organics. Are you meeting that, you know, next generation of consumers um, as well with your organic milk? Yeah, look, I, I guess... Um at, at ACM, we're not we're not experts in that in that space. But um, you know what we what we do look at and what we did look at um, was the uh, uh, the amount of organic milk available in the market versus the demand that we were seeing and the demand growth that we were seeing. And so for us, the the, the supply and demand equation was definitely in favour of um, of heading down that path. Mm. Do you? Oh, we've got a question. <laughs> Thanks. Um, probably for Chris or Peter, and thanks for all your presentations. Uh, Liam O'Connell is my name. I'm from the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development in Western Australia. Um, I'm very interested in the value-add sector in WA at the moment, and a lot of them are family-owned businesses like you've, you've explained. What I'm really interested in is that step where you go from a producer which are partners into the processing side of things. Because processing obviously is quite capital intensive, it's a big financial outlay, and trying to manage that with the scale of a family owned business. Um, could you maybe just explain how you got to that decision and how you're managing it? Uh, a really good question. Um, I guess uh, we, uh, with ACM, we started with a farm 12 years ago. It was, it was a big farm, it was a bit under. 10 million litres a year, so it was a big farm, but um, in hindsight, for, for us, we've, we've found that the smaller family farm um, works better, and the, the suppliers that we have are now generally in that, you know, one to six million litre range. The organic farmers, one to three, some even un, under one, and it, it just seems to be that that family unit um, seems to be the right size to get a good outcome from a dairy farm. And, and I think you, you quickly run into diseconomies of scale um, with dairy farming. So that's one observation for us. The, 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 the move into processing, uh, our first foray was about six years ago with the UHT plant in Shepparton, um, Pactum Dairy Group. Uh, uh, that was ultimately done as a 50-50 joint venture between our company, which has five owners, and uh, Freedom Foods, who are publicly listed. They subsequently bought us out, and um, that and there, there was no issues there. They they 
we're, we're interested in spending a lot more 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 money in in building more infrastructure, and that was fine. Um, we we uh, were interested in other in going a different direction, and so it was all amicable. Um, but that gave us the the funding to move into the the new plant, um, and we knew in building the organic milk pool that we were going to need some processing. So it gave us a bit of time to work towards that, and. Um, the, the site is set up to manage specialty milks, um, but you know most of the milk, 90% of the milk, at least in the first couple of years, will be conventional milk. Um, but we can start on organic, finish on conventional, because you can use organic in conventional, but not the other way around. Um, and we can make sure that the supply chain is secure. As far as the, the yeah the funding funding goes, um, yeah it is a big step. Um, uh, the, the first time round, we, we needed some help. This time round, um, you know, that's the, the the total total build. By the time we finish, uh, we've done phase one, phase two. It'll be 85, 90 million dollars by the time we finish. So it's a, a big in investment to make. Um, so uh, we're pretty passionate about uh, uh, the dairy industry, and 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 that's why we want to support our farmers as best we can. We have a question in the middle here. Can we have a microphone to? Oh, very sorry, Chris. <laughs> is he happy? Okay, so um, we've got somebody in the centre there. Hi, um, Simon from the Tasmanian Department of Primary Industries, Parks and Water. Um, waste is obviously a big issue down in Tasmania for us. Um, first part of the question is probably specifically for Krista. Um, with the bananas and things that, and all the other products that you process, um, do you use all of it? Um, so like, you know, is there any wastage out of the product that you do actually use? Um, and then just generally more for the panel, how do you deal with issues of waste or excess food and things in your areas? Okay, thanks. It's a great question. So obviously with the bananas, we have a lot of banana peels. <laughs> um, so we are using those, we extract the antioxidants from them and we've made our own cosmetic range, like a banana ointment is our flagship. But we also then sell that green banana antioxidant from the peel to other cosmetic companies all around the world. And they use it in their own cosmetics as an antioxidant, but also as a natural preservative. Um, our next factory, which we're, we'll have up and running in Walkerman next year, we'll actually be putting in our own biodigesters because we run a very sustainable, uh, energy efficient factory. Um, which we're now looking at converting totally off-grid. So all that excess banana peels, that's really the only waste we have. That will all be going straight into our biodigesters to, yeah, to power up the office and the other bits of plant and equipment. I did just want to like head back a little bit on the previous question as well. Um, our model is a little bit probably different to Peter's in that um, look, Rob and I started off this whole thing. We're our own investors and it was a huge risk. You know, we'd done something that had never been done in the world. And um, <laughs> wow, they, you know, how could I go and ask someone else for their hard earned dollars in proving that this was going to be where the market was? So we did in, it, through our innovation, we did invest in ourselves quite significantly and now that we've taken all that risk out of it and shown that it can be a very profitable business, we're setting up the, it's like a grower co-op model because it simply doesn't make sense for us to keep building bigger factories in far north Queensland to process all the produce from, say, Victoria. It makes better sense to put them in rural, regional locations where the produce is at the source. And then, you know, perhaps if the produce is only travelling three or 400 kilometres to be processed, it's much better than sending it 2,000 kilometres north to me. So that's, that's what we're looking at now is that grower co-op. And it's, the risk has been taken away. Every farm's got the excess produce. They want the magic that we've created here with the customer and that's where all of that experience over these years 
we've found out how to get that sequence right from that problem of waste right through to the consumer and it's a much more affordable venture for family farms to take on rather than saying oh, that's it I'm going to go and build a massive factory that I'm not quite sure on for a five twenty million dollars no one has that kind of cash to just go out on a limb like that but when you look at an investment of say five to six hundred thousand it's much more affordable and they're going to get a far better return andre is there enough advantage that australia takes of our clean green image and our healthy sort of food do you think uh look i think australia's um Remember, there was the uh, uh, owner of Chibani spoke at Monash. Humdi. And, uh, well, Humdi. Humdi, that's right. And he was like, you guys are sitting on the best brand in the world, and it's called Australia. Because the reputation that Australia has globally is, is quite phenomenal. And um, that's one of the reasons, strategically, he's uh, invested so heavily in Australia. And I think we're really well placed in, in Asia. So uh, a lot of the trends, and I think you're both really well placed. Um, we, we've recently uh, sent product to Japan. Um, there is a really strong demand for Australian produce. So, but the value adding piece, I think if we keep working like this, um, that, that's what our economy needs. We can do it. And yeah, I'm really excited to be part of this region. <laughs> Food manufacturing went through a major downturn, especially during the mining boom and the high Australian dollar. It all but wrecked Australian food uh, processing. It's now become a more innovative and more sort of R&D focused sector with food inputs and, and, and exports of such. Um, do you see a transformation? Are we seeing now a transformation of, of food processing, Angeline, do you think? Yeah, sure. I think we absolutely are. I mean, seven and a half or so years ago when we put this initiative off now called the Monash Food Innovation, um, they, it was exactly that. It was actually doom and gloom. But I think what we had was the optimum of Asia and the opportunity that is beyond also our shores. But what we have seen is a huge transformation because what we've got is not just the clean green provenance, we've got fantastic researchers, fantastic science and fantastic pathways to commercialization. I think what we lack is the connectivity to bring it together and do it more and more. So hearing a story like Krista's and that question on waste is classic and I love it that you're already doing it you're getting value out of waste already and there's already the science and the technology is already done we just need one for people to know and then where to go to actually be able to do that as well so if we can get connectivity if we can share the stories I think that starts to uh, you know make it buoyant as well and we're seeing a lot of um, you know, I was in Singapore last week, a lot of the Kiwis coming through and now looking at Australia as the hotbed of innovation, of ideas, but also as a test market into Asia as well. So we shouldn't lose that, I think. Um, uh, but the key is it's not just clean, green, safe. I think, you know, we've been lucky to have that. And hopefully we continue to have that with all of our biosecurity um, uh, efforts, but we do need to create a point of difference. And the only way you win in the market is when you are different and you're unique, and that can only be through innovation. Perhaps we can have a final comment from each of you now. Um, yeah, I guess just following up on from that, I think innovation's absolutely important, and yes, we're very, very well placed, but we need to make sure um, yeah, and, I, and I think we, we want to look at the value-added products and push ourselves up the, up the value chain as much as we can, but we can't lose sight of our costs. Um, we've got to be efficient and low-cost producers because we can't turn, for, for dairy, for example, we can't turn every kilogram of milk solids that we produce into, in Australia into a value-added product. So we do need to make sure as a, as a country and as a nation uh, that we are remaining efficient and relative and relevant and able to compete on the world stage, and that means we need to keep in on investing, keep on investing in in new infrastructure, investing in new assets um, to keep improving that efficiency and and keep working on our cost of production, and that goes from farm to processing all, all the way through. 
Krista, did you want to make a final comment there? Yeah, look, I really agree with what you just said, Peter. It's a global marketplace. And as much as we're producing a product that ticks all the boxes and comes from Australia, we can't go out there and expect consumers to pay 200% more than someone else who's making the same product. Um, you have to remain price competitive, even though we are ticking all the boxes, we still have to remain price competitive, especially for those bulk uh, commodities, really. And Andre? Uh, and look, to, to sum it up, I think a lot of it comes back to that Australian grit and determination, because we can do this. And the stories of Peter and Krista and, you know, tenacity, keep working at it, keep working, and it can be done. Um, I think we've got to lose the excuses in Australia, if I use that word. And what I mean by that is, is um, we talk about our population um, isn't as big, but then there's like uh, people talk about India, 1.2, 1.3 billion, but 20 million can af afford a can of Coke. That's the sort of thing people talk about. So w w New Zealand doesn't talk about po population as much. Just get on and do it. It can be done. We can definitely got to work together get over all the hurdles, but it can be done. I spent about uh, 12 years reporting on doom and gloom in the horticulture sector and uh, how it didn't have any out market access and there was excess produce and it was all being dumped on the Australian market. I left that reporting sector because I think I got a bit down about it. I wish I was back reporting because these are fascinating stories and, you know, the development of ready meals is the fastest I've ever seen it and I've seen a factory doing that sort of Bay Marine where it par cooks things that goes into the food service sector. I think Australia uh, can play a big role in that and certainly the Food Innovation Centre is one that's really picking up the slack in research and development and I think that's been a really theme, a really you know, strong theme throughout these talks is the research and development, the innovation and really finding what the consumer wants and accessing that market. So I'd like you to thank all the speakers.